You know, even the most hardened atheist wants me to be right about God. I think it's one of the reasons that atheist trolls online seem to obsess about making time to disagree with me and other people who assert that there is a God. And why would you want me to be right? Well, why wouldn't you want me to be right? Look, most people throughout history have believed in God. A vast majority of people today still believe in God. Part of the reason is that we all want to. We want to believe that there's something after death. I mean, look, no one's actually really satisfied with this idea that you die, become worm food, and then dust, and then story over. No one's actually really satisfied with this idea that if I love someone, that's no more than particles in my brain firing around convincing me that, that I have actual worth, the person has actual worth, and this we share this, this metaphysical experience of love. You know, no one wants to reduce that to just biological processes. We want there to be more. We want to have a soul. We want to have this possibility of eternal life. We want a life that has actual purpose and meaning. Faith says, go ahead, lean into that hope because that hope has an answer and the answer is real. And you know, one beautiful thing, guys, the more we learn about the created world, despite claims that faith is anti-science, the more we learn about science, the more it shouts to us that all this is real. That the hope you have isn't unfounded and it's not a mere blind leap of faith. Not that the reasons can necessarily cause faith, but the reasons lead you to the threshold of faith and make that next step, which is an act of the will and a re relationship with God, it makes that step a logical one to take. And I'm going to talk about that very logical step of faith with one of the most brilliant people I've ever met, Father Robert Spitzer, who's a Jesuit Catholic priest and a physicist. We're going to dive into questions like, is faith anti-science? Do we know that there's a definitive beginning to the universe? And does that point to a maker? Or is saying there's a maker just the God of the gaps? We're going to talk about whether or not intelligent life points necessarily to an intelligent creator and what all that has to do with the meaning of life. We're actually going to even talk about aliens which is kind of fun. I encourage you guys, after you watch this, forward this to a friend who struggles with faith. Because it's not that the reasons equal faith any more than the reasons I should have married my wife equal to marriage. At the end of the day, you got to make a choice, enter that relationship. But the reasons do point to it, and it makes faith easier. So, so share this with them. And know that even your most hardened atheist friend, maybe especially the one that gives you a hard time, wants you to be right. So lean into that. Also lean into this, guys. If you're watching me right now from the sideline, jump off the sideline into the game, become a missionary of joy. You're the ones that make all this possible. You're helping us reach millions of people through this video ministry. Go to reallifecatholic.com, become a missionary of joy today, support us. God love you. And here is our interview with Father Spitzer. Father Robert Spitzer, so good to have you back. Shaking your hand right oh, here. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm so grateful for all your work. Uh, uh, a lot of people presume that faith is anti-science. You have the audacity to write a book. Science at the doorstep of God, and uh, this is this one flies right in the face face of the atheists who 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 think it's either science or faith. I got to pick one or the other. Yeah, right. Uh, well, how do you answer that? I, I think there's a handful of historic figures who might disagree with the claim that faith is anti-science. Could you rattle some of them off? Sure. Yeah, I, I could. Many of them Jesuits like uh, you. Oh, yeah. Well, there are many of them, but of course, uh, the person who discovered the Big Bang theory, for example, was a Catholic priest by the name. Incredible. Father Georges Lemaitre, and uh, that's now the most comprehensive cosmological theory that there is. Uh, so uh, he was a priest who was certainly uh, not uh, anti-scientific. He was very much with it. And uh, uh, Nicholas Steno was a Catholic bishop, but he's also the father of contemporary uh, geology and stratigraphy. And we also have um, uh, Nicholas Copernicus was a Catholic cleric. Um, he did. He wasn't ordained, uh, but he was a Catholic cleric. And he, of course, he's responsible for the Copernican revolution and the first mathematical justification of heliocentrism, the sun being at the center of uh, the solar system. For, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, you can uh, look at um, a variety of other. Oh, and, uh, Gregor uh, Mendel. Uh, people Gen know genetics. him as the father of, that's right, the father of quantitative genetics. Uh, he was not only a priest, but an abbot, an Augustinian abbot, and uh, uh, a very fine person. So uh, when you Some go, folks might say, like, th these were, well, that's just because they're thinking human beings. Uh, or they might have the impression that they were acting outside the church. They were literally funded by the church to do the things they did. That's exactly right. And they were allowed not only to do it, 
but the church allowed them to publish all of it. And even, you know, the church has had its own pontifical institute uh, for um, uh, uh, sciences uh, for, you know, a couple of hundred years already. And there are so many Nobel Prize winners in, in it. And, you know, I might add, too, it's not just the Catholics uh, that are very pro-science, although certainly they are. Uh, there's a wonderful little uh, website, you know, the wiki on uh, clergy mm. scientists, and you can get 182 of them wow. uh, listed there. And the interesting thing, too, is today, uh, more scientists than ever are declaring themselves to be believers in God. Wow. So when, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, certain surveys were done uh, in maybe about uh, uh, the 40s and the 50s, uh, you know, it was probably true at that time. I think around 44% of scientists declared themselves to be believers in God. It's increasing uh, now. Oh, today, overall, it's 51% wow. declare themselves to be believers in That's God. That's cool. 21% agnostic, 20% atheist. That's the Pew survey of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And then among wow. the young scientists, this is the really interesting one, 35 years or younger, the young scientists are 66%. A supermajority declare themselves uh, to wow. be uh, believers in God or higher transcendent power. Only 15% agnostic, 15% atheist. Wow. So it's really decided. Doctors, even more profoundly so, 76% uh, of doctors uh, declare themselves to be um, believers in God or higher transcendent power. And uh, like it's only 11% of them uh, are athe atheists. <laughs> I can't and, believe how powerful the, the new wave of atheists, the, the branding they've done of faith, yeah. that leads people to believe, well, if you're a thinking a scientist, obviously yeah. there's no, no space for faith for you. Yeah. And, 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 and all the stats are showing the opposite. Now, I, I understand yeah. why religious faith and specifically Christian faith would lead to science. Because mm -hmm. it presupposes this worldview that says the universe makes sense. That's right. Because it has a designer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also presupposes a worldview that's not uh, pantheistic and, and pagan, where it says, I can't study the world because it is God. Yeah. Right? So it, it, it tees us up for, for the sciences. Yeah. Well, now, all the greatest scientists in the world anyway. I mean, Galileo Galilei was still a Catholic and a very profoundly believing Catholic. Yeah. People think, well, he was an atheist. You know, no, he wasn't. Uh, Sir Isaac Newton was not an atheist, a very much a believing Christian. Mm. And you go, right, James Clerk Maxwell, uh, electrodynamism and the equations of electromagnetism, right? Uh, definitely a believing Christian. That's awesome. And you go right through the thing all the way to Max, Max Planck, good uh, uh, Lutheran fellow, of quantum theory, of course, I don't have to explain. And uh, uh, Albert Einstein didn't believe in a personal God, but he believed in an intelligence. So Intelligence, uh, yeah. divine intelligence, and certainly Werner Heisenberg, uh, a very religious man, and um, uh, uh, Sir Arthur Eddington, uh, a Quaker, uh, but a, a believing uh, Christian as well. Um, it's and incredible. You know, I mean, these are the these are the guys. I mean, yeah. the, the, you know, that without whom we would not have contemporary physics today. <laughs> oh, you know, they're all believing Christians. I mean, let's face facts. Uh, uh, you know, faith is not alienating. Uh, from really good scientists mm. uh, throughout the course and of history. And there is empirical evidence to back that. There's a lot of empirical <laughs> yeah, evidence to back yeah. that, and that's what the book's about. That's it. Yeah, so we, <laughs> so we have faith leading to science. Yeah. We also have science leading to faith. Yeah. And, and the more we learn about this this universe we find ourselves in, mm -hmm. the more it becomes impossible to deny that you you, you lift up the sheets there and there's, there's, there's something... On the other side of that curtain, right? Yeah, uh, I wanna, and I want to go through a couple of the ways that you do this in the yeah. book, uh, which is it's it's beautiful. Science at the doorstep of God, Father Robert Spitzer. Get it, get it for everybody you know. Get it for every uh, every uh, staunch atheist in your life who just you know, hey, if you, you want to look at some facts, they're here. And 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 actually, it takes more of a leap of faith after reading some of this stuff and looking at the evidence. Yeah. To, to not believe in God. I really believe it does. And I, obviously, a lot of our young scientists think the very same thing because yeah. it's just becoming overwhelming. But even, you know, when I debated, uh, you know, Stephen Hawking and, and Leonard Milano, and Leonard Mladenov, Deepak Chopra on the Larry King show in 2010, Stephen at that time was pretty much saying, you know, that uh, the universe, we know that the universe does not need a creator. We can actually uh, show that this is a case, you know, scientism. Uh, can actually be, you know, self-sufficient. Well, in 2018, boy, 
he the, he changed the entire landscape, Hawking did. Uh, really? Basically, he comes out in his last article in the Journal of High Energy Physics and basically says, you know, hey, um, uh, oh, the, the name of the article, I should say, is A Smooth Exit from Eternal, underlined, eternal inflation. Now, that's wow. a byword. Eternal inflation is what produces basically the multiverse. But if you have, a, what Stephen Hawking is saying is, even a multiverse is going to require a beginning. And really? you can't, that's right. And you can't, therefore, have an infinite multiverse. So he was backpedaling. Even Stephen Hawking, I applaud his honesty. Yeah, he changed his mind completely. I mean, uh, it was, uh, that was his last scholarly article before he died. But he actually wow. changed his mind completely. His uh, co author, uh, Thomas Hertog, both of them were working with wow. Lisa and Lyco, the gravitational wave um, you know, detectors that were there and could actually you know, see that you, you really couldn't have um, a universe like ours. Uh, emerging from a fractal multiverse. And yeah, the, h- how yeah. does the science point to the fact that the universe once was not and now is? Yeah. Like that it has a beginning, and, and then how does that, I mean, it seems obvious to me, has a point to the existence of a god, mm-hmm. but go ahead. Well, um, there's actually three major ways. The first is called the Board of Lincoln and Guth theorem. And the Board of Lincoln and Guth theorem. We're going to have to get uh, that written under the screen for us, but go ahead, yeah. Yeah. The Board of Lincoln and Guth theorem is, um, uh, well, the three uh, physicists, very well known, Arvind Borda from uh, UC, uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, then um, uh, Alexander Lincoln, director of the Institute of Cosmology at Tufts University in Boston, and um, uh, Alan Guth, who is the uh, uh, probably going to get the Nobel Prize for inflationary uh, theory discovery. But anyway, he's uh, got he uh, a thing or two. chair of, uh, at MIT in cosmology. So, so yeah, he does. <laughs> these three are not uh, exactly slouches in the cosmological domain. But anyway, they came up with a proof in 2003 that basically showed that any um, uh, uh, universal system or multiversal system, right? String universal system, yeah. any of those, you know, ways in which we think physical reality manifested itself. Um, if it has an average Hubble expansion greater than zero, would have to have a beginning. Mm. Now, if you look at that, that just means that the universe or the multiverse as a whole would have to have, a, you know, a velocity as a whole greater than zero. Now, if that were the case, um, you know, um, if you know the if uh, Board of Lincoln Guth are right, then that would mean that a multiverse would have to have a beginning, wow. because all multiverses are have to be inflation. No matter how you want to slice it, yep. it has a start. It has a start, uh, yeah. which implies that there is a thing that started it. So yeah, that's right. So it doesn't no, matter. Nothing can't can't make something. That's right. No, 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 that's exactly right. In fact, uh, whether it is a multiverse or you know, whether it's a string universe in the higher dimensional space of string theory, whether it's just uh, a bouncing universe, expands, it expands, it expands, it expands, it can't do it back infinitely. You can prove all of this with BVG. You can also prove it uh, with Board of Lincoln Guth proof. You can also prove it with entropy, uh, you know, which is the, the winding down of our universe. So you can actually, there is a lot of evidence uh, mm-hmm. to show that the universe or the multiverse uh, would need a beginning. Now, a lot of kids... And the so, entropy, by the way, like it, everything would wind down to some still point of well, chaos, That's right. right? We, uh, that's right. We would today have no physical activity whatsoever. So it would have happened already if the infi- if universe, the universe were, infinite. were infinite. Absolutely correct. And so basically you can show through these methods, Stephen Hawking's uh, proof as well uh, of a beginning uh, of a, you know, of a multiverse, uh, you know, and the beginning of inflation. All of these things are really, really important uh, proofs uh, of a beginning. But as you already pointed out, a beginning is very significant in physics because prior to the beginning, physical reality, whether it's a multiverse, a bouncing universe, just our universe, whatever it may be, if it had a beginning, then prior to the beginning, physical reality would be nothing. Mm. And of course, if you don't sneak something into nothing, if you just let nothing be nothing, then Parmenides' old statement is true. All that can come from nothing is nothing. (laughs) So in other words, the only thing nothing can do is nothing because it's nothing. Now, if that's the case, then we can know that if physical reality, whatever it is, multiverse, string universe, just our universe, whatever, if that multiverse had a, a beginning, then prior to that beginning, it was nothing, it could do nothing, and therefore it could not have moved itself from nothing to something. And therefore, something else, 
something that transcends physical reality, mm. something that's beyond physical reality, something that's got the power to create ex nihilo from nothing <laughs> would have to exist in order to move our universe or the multiverse from its state of nothingness prior to the beginning to something. And that sounds like right. God to me. I, I, I think so, yeah, yeah. right? I mean, God, why don't you reveal yourself? Uh, have you yeah. guys not noticed literally everything? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, it's a great point. <laughs> no, 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 the atheists got, well, the thing will be their gotcha. Yeah. Is, well, yeah. you're claiming that everything has to be created. Well, well then what, what about this highly intelligent being that's so complicated it had the power to make everything? Gotcha. And no, As if you hadn't thought of this. Yes. No, no Catholic yeah. mind in history has ever thought of such a thing. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And of course, the, the, the premise that you started with, everything needs a beginning, is absolutely incorrect. Mm -hmm. There's never been a scientist or a metaphysician who ever thought that. So, of course, uh, that's the first thing. The reason Ooh, we So think, the fact that the universe does have a beginning shows it was started by something, but not everything yeah. does need a beginning. That's right. Everything does not need a beginning. And, of course, you can't have everything having a beginning, because if you did, then nothing would exist. Yeah. So the first thing is, we know that everything doesn't have a beginning. Mm. Some things have a beginning, some things don't. Now, of course, as we shall see, um, we have very good proof, both metaphysically and from physical sciences, that the universe or a multiverse or a string universe has a beginning. Mm. Now, that means there's got to be something else out there that doesn't have a beginning. There's something else that doesn't have a point prior to which it was nothing. Yeah. And let's just call that for a second. We'll call it God. But you can actually prove that it is God. And that's what I do in chapter three of that book, as I give this philosophical proof for the existence of God. I also want to say that there's uh, non-material things. Like in our experience, everything yeah. that's material has to be created. Yeah. But immaterial things, for instance, a concept, two plus two is four, mm -hmm. didn't have to be made by something. That's correct. Uh, right. But then, but then two plus two is four can't create a universe. So there's, yeah, there's some immaterial thing that, yeah. that had the power mm -hmm. to make everything. But continue with, with the book where you, you then... You know, basically, you can actually prove that whatever doesn't have a beginning uh, is actually um, transtemporal, and whatever's transtemporal, of course, has to be transmaterial and so forth. Define so transtemporal for us. Really. Oh, trans it means beyond time. Beyond it, time. It's, it's what we call, what Aquinas or Augustine would have called the eternal now. In other words, mm -hmm. uh, it, you, we would look at it as a now. Of course, it has a dimensionality that we cannot comprehend because we are immersed in linear temporality. In other words, mm -hmm. we, we see the world as if time is a series of successions. But from the mm -hmm. vantage point of God, it's like you know, you, everything resolves to a point and then comes down. Yeah. So you, you basically see, oh, well, very good then. Um, you know, God can sort of... You know, the, the future and, and the past are identical to God from his perspective. We can't understand it, but it's, it's certainly possible. And there's a very good proof that shows whatever is transtemporal has to be, as it were, uh, you know, an, an unrestricted um, huh. act of thinking. That's the only way you're going to get a transtemporal what reality. An, what an awesome, I'm just sorry, what yeah. an awesome way to see life. Yeah. <laughs> How much more exciting is this? Yeah. To think that there's this, this source of everything, this intelligent yeah. creator. Yeah. And what despair to see life without this. I, I, on yeah. the 25 freeway recently, I saw a billboard. Yeah. Uh, the meaning of life is to make up your own meaning. I'm thinking, you uh, actually think that's supposed to make me happy? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> really? Like, come on, man. Yeah, it doesn't make me happy uh, just to think that I could uh, think of some fiction. No. And then uh, I know it's make-believe. Like, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I want, Unless I'm delusional, I know it's make believe. Oh, I want the unconditionally loving Creator to be real. Thank <laughs> you very much, and I want the heaven that He, uh, you know, gives us clues to in those near death experiences. I want that to be just as real. So yes, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, and of course in Christian revelation, I might point out. Do, do you uh, dive into the to the the fine tuning of the universe and of yeah. life and of uh, maybe? Uh, do you make any arguments from irreducible complexity? I, I don't uh, do irreducible complexity because uh, um, I think we have a mathematics that proves it well enough without having to get to the point of pure irreducibility. Okay. And, uh, so you're, you're trying to go a little more minim minimalist and, and safe there, yeah. just in case there is some scientific explanation. Yeah, yeah, right? That's right. So I basically look at free parameters in our universe, 
Um, and What's so, that mean? Uh, oh, well, a free parameter is something that is not determined by the laws of physics uh, in our universe. So there are, like, for example, uh, we have these constants in our universe. There are numbers that control everything, but they're not anticipated by the laws of physics. They're purely arbitrary. Now, here's the deal. Mm. If those numbers had been even ever so slightly different at the Big Bang than they were, you'd never have a universe wow. that's capable of a life form. It's wow. exceedingly, exceedingly, the, the, the exceeding. numbers behind the physics of the Big Bang of the Big Bang are just that that make life uh, possible are so exceedingly improbable that there's <laughs> absolutely no way they could have happened by pure chance. You can actually show that to be the case mathematically, and and so wow. the, the the fact is, for example, just to get low entropy in our universe, low entropy may, basically means the order needed in the universe. Uh, so you can have what we call net macroscopic flows of energy and matter. And that just that? simply means that you can have activity, meaningful activity and changes. Okay. So if you're going to have not any just dead atoms everywhere. Yeah, not just dead nothing. Yeah. You know, a warmth. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So, but if you if you're going to have something more, uh, you're going to have to have low entropy. Wow. The odds of having our low entropy at the Big Bang are 10 raised to the 10 raised to the 123 to 1. Say that number again? That, <laughs> Let's, we uh, show that on the screen if you can fit yeah. it, which we won't be able to. Yeah. Yeah. No. But uh, yeah, that's that's the same odds of, uh, as a monkey typing the entire corpus of Shakespeare by random tapping of the keys perfectly in a single try. <laughs> Not, you know, nobody believes that that can happen, and nobody believes that low entropy can happen just by pure chance. Uh, it is really? Just, well, it, when someone says, God of the gaps, I'm thinking, you're yeah. putting a science of the gaps in, in that yeah. level of, of small probability yeah, yeah. and thinking you, you, you want me to go along with that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, people don't, I mean, as Roger Penrose said, you know, he's the one who calculated the number, right? And, and the number is very much, you know, the, uh, you know, easily calculable. It's, it's, there's nothing, you know, you just take the, the entropy per baryon and then the total number of baryons and, uh, basically, um, uh, you come up with 10 to the 123. And if you want the, the odds <laughs> of having order amidst all that entropy, well, it's, um, what, uh, the opposite of a logarithm, basically. And, uh, so it's 10 <laughs> raised to the 10 raised to the 123 to one. And you look at that and you go, Oh my gosh, you gotta be kidding. And uh, no, I'm not kidding. And yet we have it. It's in our universe. All I can tell you is, if Stephen Hawking is right, mm. and you can only have a very small number of bubble universes uh, in, a, in a multiverse, if indeed there was a multiverse, only a small number of bubble universes, you're not going to be able to explain low entropy, mm. period. Mm. You're going to have to make recourse to God, to a highly intelligent creator. And the same thing, I mean, we, we've got a thing called the cosmological constant. This is the exact rate of acceleration of our universe out of its singularity. Um, it wasn't really a true singularity. It's 10 to the minus 33 centimeters at the beginning. But nevertheless, really small. The whole universe is clapping that this little, you know, uh, almost pin, much, 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 much smaller than the pinpoint. Um, and uh, of course, you take that, that, uh, um, you know, dimension, all of a sudden, kaboom, this universe expands, but it expands just like Goldilocks right. And mm. not too fast and not too slow. Well, the odds of having that acceleration of our universe out of the Big Bang occurring by pure chance is one part in 10 to the 120. Wow. That's 10 to the 120 is a trillion. It's impossible. 10 times. So it's a trillion, 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 trillion. One part in a trillion, 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 trillion. You know, are you kidding me? We hit the right number. Like, you know, I mean, that's And you only get one try at a big bang. That's right. So you spread out a big, huge map across the entire universe, and you throw one dart at that baby. And you've got one point on the map across the entire universe to hit. Yeah, no, people, people could argue yeah. more, well, the universe is this big, so life's bound to emerge somewhere because yeah. you know, all, the, all, the, all these chances. But no, you, you had you one big bang. You can't get you a universe. One big bang. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at the Big Bang, you, first, you need a universe that'll permit a life form. Right, right. I mean, let's face it. If you just took, for example, uh, you know, we have these constants for every one of our four forces. So, you know, the electromagnetic force has three constants, the mass of the proton, mass of the electron, electromagnetic charge. And then the strong nuclear force 
has the strong nuclear force coupling constant. So then you've got the, the weak force has the weak force constant. And you've got the, uh, um, uh, the um, uh, uh, gravitational force has gravitational force constant. So you take these four forces and they're all their constants. You just alter those numbers ever so slightly. For example, if you just take the, um, uh, the weak force constant uh, and the gravitational constant relative to the cosmological constant, you alter those two constants by one part in 10 to the 50th. That's like a trillion, 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 trillion. One part in 10 to the trillion, 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 <laughs> right? So you alter it one part, the universe will either um, uh, be totally explosive in the Big wow. Bang to this wow. very day, which wow. parenthetically would have been really bad for life. For <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, just incendiary universe. Or the universe, boom, just collapse into a black hole wow. and squish the entire mass of the universe into 10 to the minus 33 but, centimeters, which is parenthetically really bad for life forms. The mathematical so, perfection of the mind of God. It's yeah. Just, it's, it's beautiful. Unbelievable. Okay, I'm going to do the laziest thing I could possibly do as an interviewer. <laughs> what did we leave out here that you're like, oh, you got you got to hit this? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of things we left out, but I'll just simply say but, this. The, yeah, yeah. The, what, you what know, makes the, your heart explode the well, most? Well, I, I think, uh, honestly, the, the human beings make my heart explode explode. Mm. And the fact that I think human beings are undeniably, um, you know, a transphysical mm. um, uh, being, that is to say, we have a soul with a transphysical capacity amidst all the complexity and beauty of the universe. One human being out glorifies and outweighs <laughs> it all. It has something which all the multiverses <laughs> of the world couldn't give rise to. And that's transphysical processes that manifest themselves in self-consciousness, survival after bodily death, uh, you know, uh, rational intellect, the transcendental desires, perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home. All these things. I mean, one little soul is worth more than the whole universe in terms of its transphysicality, the glory of that transphysicality, and the reflection of the glory of God in that transphysicality. And that's, I do talk about that, you know, in the book as well with the, the, the near death experiences and the evidence for a soul and, mm -hmm. Um, you know, the whole, you know, you know, presence, the transcendental desires and, uh, you know, the numinous experience and, you know, and John Henry Newman's, you know, uh, Father, proof of conscience. If you, if you could see, you could see that you made me cry. Uh, well done. <laughs> um, and we'll pray, we'll pray that study comes back. Yeah. Thank you but, so but, much. But I, I do, it's, it's, it is amazing to think of the mind of God, the, the complexity and beauty and vastness of the universe and how we feel so small in it. And God is looking down saying, you are absolutely huge next to this. There's, oh, yeah. there's no ocean that can love. There's no galaxy that, that can choose. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing else made in his image and likeness. And we, we, we confuse uh, vast amounts of cosmic space with significance. Yep, exactly. Right, And this consciousness and the self-awareness, the soul this, that goes beyond when all the stars have gone out and we're still around, uh, that's... Whew. Can I ask you a bonus question? Yeah. You think there's aliens? <laughs> Well, well, you know, because any um, other intelligent life forms in some other corner of the universe yeah. having an interview somewhere. Yeah. Well, <laughs> let me let me put it this way: if they if there were intelligent life in the universe like us uh, that had our kind of rational consciousness that did mathematics like we do, in other words, we we violate the you know the Gödel incompleteness theorems, and so you know the uh, you know Kurt uh, Gödel uh, has these uh, you know uh, uh, incompleteness theorems. We do mathematics that transcends that the rational consciousness of abstraction, but this cannot be explained, um, you know, by, uh, uh, you know, physical processes and structures. The same thing with self-consciousness. Can't be explained by, by physical processes. There's transcendental desires. Mm -hmm. Can't be explained by physical processes. So if we see an alien who's like us, has rational consciousness, does mathematics like us, uh, you know, has uh, transcendental desires for perfect truth, love, goodness, being at home like us, if we see that alien, you can be sure of one thing. He did not evolve from a purely materialistic, organic, physical process. In other mm -hmm. words... God had to give him a soul too. Mm. And if God gave that alien a soul, then I would venture to say that um, uh, we better catechize him about Jesus Christ because odds are if he has a soul, then he's free. And if he's free, <laughs> he might have had a fall. And if he did have a fall and he doesn't know about Jesus Christ, he may know about Jesus Christ, but if he doesn't know, we got to catechize him and baptize him right away. <laughs> So that's my thought about aliens. <laughs> I'm going to sign up to be the first uh, intergalactic evangelist. If you well, would join me. Uh, I would love to. <laughs> Maybe we'll send, the, send these waves out to space. If you're watching us from the planet... From, from I don't know, make up a planet name, Matt, something, uh, Matopia. Yeah. <laughs> the Lord loves you. He's called you to conversion and, and to, to give yourself to him. And, uh, yeah, yeah exactly. 
Father, thanks. This is a pure joy. Oh, okay. good. Yeah, you bolster our faith and you bolster our joy. Oh, thanks so Handshake much, Handshake right there. Thank you so much, Thank Chris. you so much. Okay. God bless you. Thank you guys for watching. I got to give a shout out to Father Robert Spitzer and Magis Center. Go to magiscenter.com. Click on the resources link. He's produced incredible programs for high school seniors, for junior high kids, and for parish adults that cover everything that we talked about today in our interview, including stuff about the existence of the soul, the Shroud of Turin, miracles, and give compelling reasons for faith. So go get all of it. That's an unpaid ad. <laughs> I'm just trying to share the faith, and it's great stuff. Magiscenter.com. Click on the resources link. We'll put links in our show notes. Guys, thank you so much for watching. Above all, thanks for having the courage to share this with people who may not agree with you but who want you, again, to be right. Because who doesn't want a reason for living, a hope of this eternal life, a knowledge that there's a soul and more to us than a bag of bones. So be bold in sharing it. God love you. We'll see you next time.